Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Inside the OC podcast. My name is Matt Canizaro, and very, very excited about today's show. Not only is Aaron Smith back with us for the duration, but uh, we have a gentleman coming on to talk to us who I looked up to as a left-hander growing up in the great state of Florida. Uh, we're going to talk about all things Open Championships, of course. Uh, we'll talk about his great career. We'll talk about the Florida Gators, the Washington football team, uh, and very much more over the course of the next 60 or so minutes. Uh, and with that, let's get right to it. Let's bring in Aaron Smith. We'll catch up on what's been happening over the past week, what's coming up, and then we'll bring in today's special guest. Aaron, welcome back. Thanks, Matty. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, excellent job on the show last week uh, with Mike and Cortez. Enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I know you can do this on your own now, so soon you're going to let me fly away. But uh, I appreciate the chance to come back and especially the uh, the opportunity to uh, get to spend this hour or so with uh, two great left-handers and two great Florida Gator fans. So you got the bowling ball right there in the background. It's showing already. So uh, it's going to be a pretty awesome conversation. Definitely looking forward to it. Well, I appreciate you stopping by and tuning into last week's show, uh, even while you're away. Yes, I was able to handle it, but it certainly uh, wasn't half as much fun uh, without you there behind the scenes. And of course, uh, I sweated through a couple shirts trying to keep things moving. Uh, didn't want any debacles live on the air, but uh, we made it great content as we get ready for the Open Championships right around the corner. May 1st is our start date. Protocols and procedures are out there available on bull.com. Uh, we're putting the final pieces into place. Uh, and of course, that show was about how to get ready with about eight weeks left till we get going. What do you have to do to prepare? Uh, and if there's anybody who can help get us ready and talk about ways to succeed at the Open Championships, uh, it's going to be today's guest. So let's go ahead and get right to it. Let's bring him in. Everybody's favorite left-hander, uh, Jason Couch. Welcome to Inside the OC. Hey, guys. What's happening? We're glad to have you. Uh, we know uh, you've got some great insight about this event, bowling in general. Uh, so we look forward to hearing all of that and talking about uh, all things Florida Gators along the way. But first, as we traditionally do, let's catch up on what life has been like. We know 2020 was pretty wacky for all of us. Uh, and you, of course, uh, have endured some some different career changes in your path over the last couple of years. And, and I'm sure 2020 didn't help. But uh, catch us up. What has life been like for you and the family uh, there in the Sunshine State and uh, and the bowling career and all those good things? Yeah, I mean, for sure, 2020 was uh, a weird year, to say the least. Um, you know, I tried to make the best of it. A lot more home time with the with the kids and the wife, and she hasn't kicked me out yet, so I feel pretty good about that. Um, you know, I was I was in full gear, ready to go. You know, I, I had turned 50 uh, two Novembers ago. You know, I was ready for the senior tour. I was practiced up, ready to go, and then, you know, COVID-19 hit. And just basically put a stop to everything. So uh, it uh, it was a little disappointing. Um, I'm looking forward to, to competing against the guys on the PBA 50. I feel like I'm ready. I, I definitely put in some work and uh, looking forward to it. Uh, you mentioned the, the wife and the youngins, of course. Uh, you spent a lot of time on the road in your career and, and even in your new job path. Uh, but uh, to be stuck at home, as we say, for you guys, the Orlando area. I think there's there's probably worse places to be. Uh, and again, uh, the upside of all this, of course, was getting to enjoy a little extra time uh, and, and see uh, some things perhaps that uh, maybe you don't get to take advantage of uh, in, in Florida. So uh, tell us about some of the things that you were able to do over the past year that uh, might have escaped you or really uh, your entire life growing up in the area. Uh, and then, um, you know, your career took you all over the, the country and the world, but uh, there's just so much right there at home that, that maybe you got to enjoy. Yeah. You know, um, obviously a lot of things were closed up, especially early on in the 2020 year. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time with my kids, which, you know, unfortunately I didn't get to do a lot of that with my, my two older daughters, you know, since I was touring all the years that they were growing up. But, uh, Spent a lot of time with the kids. Uh, both my younger daughters are, are soccer goalies, so I got to see them play a lot of games and, you know, been fortunate enough to uh, to get to see them, help my wife out, taking them to practices, you know. Uh, but, man, spent a lot of time in the house, which I'm not real used to. So 
it was uh, it was a it's a little tougher on guys that are used to being on the road and living in a hotel 200 250 nights a year you know so I just tried to make the best of it tried to stay out of the doghouse with the wife as much as possible and uh, you know just kind of plug along and got a lot of stuff done around the house honestly I uh, man I, I repainted the the back porch I painted some of the rooms I did a lot of yard work uh, basically just you know kind of doing the maintenance around the house and making sure everything looked good. Now, of course, uh, again, for me growing up in Florida uh, and watching you on TV and, and all of your success, and uh, there wasn't one time that uh, that we've been around each other where you did not have an Ebonite logo uh, somewhere and representing the company for your entire career. Uh, and then when the bowling part went away for you, uh, there was a career opportunity for you there with Ebonite to be a, a district sales manager in the Southeast. So more bowling, more traveling, more Ebonite which is awesome. Again, you were a face of the company for so long. Uh, and then uh, as you were getting ready for the senior tour, as you mentioned, uh, the career took a little bit of a different turn, still involved in bowling and doing some things that you've been able to do at home, right? Right before the show started, uh, you're on the phone getting some sales done, taking care of some business. Uh, so a great opportunity there to, to continue working and continue to stay involved in the sport. Uh, tell us about that. I mean, it was a, a, a pretty... A lengthy transition, I guess, but uh, so much happened. And then, of course, uh, the sale of EBI, right, to, to the brands of Brunswick there. So uh, some things happening timeline-wise. Catch us up on that and kind of what things have been like from the work perspective uh, now that the bowling uh, temporarily, of course, has come to halt, but the senior tour right around the corner. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, I don't believe anybody saw, saw it coming, the transition with with Brunswick purchasing the brands of Ebonite International. I mean, I was just as stunned as anybody else. I was sitting at an Orlando Magic basketball game and my phone just started blowing up. And I'm like, man, I don't understand why all these people are calling me. And a lot of them were employees of the company at the time. And finally I took a call and I'm like, what is going on that I'm missing? And they're like, uh, we were just purchased by Brunswick. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what'd you just say? You know, just complete shock. So, uh, you know that that was uh, that was a big shock to me. And uh, I'm I'm sure you know, but a lot of people may not know. I had left the company about oh gosh four months before that. And uh, of course, I got told after they were bought. Oh, you knew this the whole time. That's why you you moved on. I'm like, no, that's that's not quite how it happens. And uh, but yeah, the. The, uh, the move to Ace Mitchell Bowlers Mart for me was really good. Um, Bob Hanley, I'm sure you guys know who Bob Hanley is. Uh, Bob had been at the company for 27 years and decided to step out and retire. And the position came, came up and uh, the owners of Ace Mitchell came in and asked me if I was interested. And I took a look at it. You know, when I worked for Ebonite, I had seven states to cover for the, uh, as a district sales manager. And with uh, Ace Mitchell, it was down to three, you know, Florida, Georgia, South of Carolina. So hmm. felt like a smart move. I'd be home more weekends, which w w which really helped as well. Um, but you know me, buddy. I, I still got the Ebonite logo. I, I wear it every day, man. So, uh, you know, I, I still bowl for Ebonite on behalf of Brunswick, and uh, I enjoy it. Uh, they've been really, really nice to me. Uh, they're great people up there in Muskegon, Michigan. And, uh, you know, I, I can't see myself being anywhere else. Well, that said, uh, Ebonite also uh, kind of synonymous with loyalty, right? And a lot of uh, very important uh, bowlers over the years going way back even to Don Carter. Uh, and now uh, as one of the faces of the brand, you were such a big deal uh, in bowling and to Ebonite that around their headquarters in Hopkinsville, right, in Kentucky, uh, there was a street named after you. Uh, that had to be a, a pretty awesome feeling and a, and a, and a great experience. And, and the folks want to know for sure uh, what has happened uh, to Jason Couchway uh, since uh, Ebonite has left the area. So uh, we we basically did a, I don't even know how you would call it, a grand reopening maybe, but when they put the street sign up, uh, it, it's a it's actual sign that has a, a backdrop of me holding my fingers up for the three-peat when I won the TSC, you know, and, and uh, so it was an awesome honor. And uh, when they packed up and they left Hopkinsville, I told my good friend Dave Wadka, 
don't you dare leave there without getting that street sign. <laughs> so my man took it down for me and sent it to me in the mail. And uh, it's, it's actually sitting up in my, uh, my office here, right behind my computer. Now, Jason, I've always had a personal goal of someday having a sandwich named after me. <laughs> uh, so I can only imagine where, you know, the, the an actual street being named after you kind of sits up in the ranking. You know, that was uh, uh, I remember when that video came out. It was so cool to see uh, you mentioned with the three Pete as well and having that uh, all part of that. Uh, you know, talk about the initial reaction when they kind of took you out there and said, you know, all this was going to happen. Uh, take us back to that moment. Yeah, we were we were in Hopkinsville for sales meetings. So all the salesmen from around the country were there. Uh, they actually had the sign covered up uh, when we drove in that morning. I'm like, what, what is this? They have a sheet on a pole. That's all I could think of. What, what's the sheet going on a pole? So never really even thought about it and had no idea what was happening. And then we took a lunch break and we all they asked us all to come out there to uh, the road and and uh, the, Mike Judy, my boss at the time, uh, the national sales manager at Ebonite, he made a speech and then pulled the sheet off. And I, I was I was in tears, man. I, I just it was a big shock to me uh, more than anything. And, uh, you know, I, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Hopkinsville, Kentucky, always will. You know, I still have a lot of friends that live there, but it was an awesome experience. And uh, I have a I have a sandwich named after me as well down at the Kegel Training Center. So I'm your guy. <laughs> uh, you are. Man. Okay. What's a, what's a sandwich now? I, I got no more. <laughs> <laughs> Good old deli sandwich at the Kegel Deli. That's that, you know, it's, it's a uh, spicy Buffalo chicken sandwich and it's, it's awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. There we go. Maddie. We, you're, you're, we speaking got all, you're speaking all my languages right now. That's it. We got the <laughs> food. food is my love language and, and bowling and every night and, it's all of the above, of course, uh, and Jason Couch. Uh, again, with all that you have accomplished in your career, of course, uh, you know the, the PBA Hall of Fame, the USBC Hall of Fame. We'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about the accomplishments, uh, but to have the respect and admiration uh, of an entire company, and really in that regard, the entire city uh, of Hopkinsville, uh, to to be part of that for three decades, uh, that has to be pretty awesome and pretty huge for the confidence as well, knowing that they've got all this support behind you, no matter what. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, the, the, my, my rookie year on the tour back way back, uh, in 92, uh, when, when, it, when we got done that season, I had gotten a couple opportunities to go visit some different companies. I went up and I spoke with Brunswick. I, I got a contract offer from them. Then I went to AMF in Richmond, Virginia. And then the third place I visited was, was Ebonite in Hopkinsville. And, uh, you know, no disrespect to the other two brands, but, I walked in the front door at Ebonite and there was a lady that sat in the front, right in the front door, Judy Garrity, just retired a couple of years ago, but she, she was there the entire time. And she just stood up and said, you're Jason Couch. You threw an Ebonite ball on TV. And I thank you for that. And I'm like, how can I not support a brand where the lady that works the front counter, the desk, that the secretary, she knows who I am because she is so proud of the bowling balls that they manufacture. I, that, that just, that got me right away. I knew I was going to be a lifer there. Well, we'll definitely talk about some of your responsibilities uh, from that regard off the lanes uh, with Ebonite and different charities and some things, but uh, let's take it way back to uh, Jason Couch growing up and kind of how the journey began for you uh, bowling center wise and practice wise and uh, how you knew that this was going to be your career uh, at least coming out of high school, that the path that you chose, and uh, it's a crossroad for for all of us, really, and and an and opportunity there. But uh, tell us about the upbringing and what got you to that point, and and what made you decide that bowling was going to be it. Yeah, so you know, really, the beginning starts at with my my parents were bowlers. You know, my dad owned a twenty four lane center when I was growing up in St. Pete, Florida, and uh, you know, I watched my my dad bowl a couple leagues a week, my mom bowled a couple leagues a week, so I would be watching them bowl, and I would go down and practice if there was lanes available and just had such a passion for it and enjoyed watching my parents bowl. And, you know, my dad was, my dad's a phenomenal bowler. I mean, he had the state record in Florida for a few years. Uh, we throw it vastly different though. <laughs> He's straight right hander. I mean, straight as a string and, but he was amazing at, at, at how well he could bowl. And uh, I told my dad at four years old, you know, I'm watching wide world of sports and bowling came on. I turned around to my dad and I said, that's what I'm going to do for a living. And, you know, as a good dad, he's like, 
Oh, I'm sure you are. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll help you out as much as we can, you know, like probably chuckling. And uh, man, I just, I couldn't get enough of the bowling. I mean, as soon as it was over on Saturday afternoons, I ran to the bowling center so I could try and throw it like the guy that won that week. And it didn't matter who it was. If it was Mark Roth or Marshall Holman or Earl Anthony, I tried to always take something out of their game and, and put it into my game. So I just, I, I've had a love for the game since I was four. Well, very cool. And your, your, your start on the PBA tour uh, was pretty early, right? You're just uh, in your early twenties there. Uh, so uh, let's just jump right to it. Uh, I had the pleasure of writing for the 50 greatest players in PBA history, the book that came out back in 2009. Of course, uh, it was a list of the 50 greatest players in PBA history, each one with its own story uh, to talk about that player. You were number 24 on the list, uh, and it was my honor to be able to write that story uh, for the book, and one of a few, uh, and uh, really enjoyed learning more about Jason Couch and, and the background and um, you know, you mentioned 1992 kind of being the start of everything for you. You're the PBA Rookie of the Year, uh, but all that almost didn't happen, right? Uh, one day you're 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 standing at a payphone calling home, uh, right. and this is uh, the eye-opening moment I think, uh, you know, for for me about the realization of how tough it really is, and uh, and a huge moment obviously for you in your career and some tough love, right? That set all of it in motion for the career that you had. Tell us about that because it got real there for a minute. And, uh, and mom and dad were, uh, were again, pretty tough. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, bowling early on, on the tour, I go out in 1992 and, and we're, we're bowling in California for the first stop. And uh, I bowled absolutely horrible. I bowled 200 under and, uh, you know, that's, that's no good for anybody. And then we, uh, we, we drove to Las Vegas the next, next week for the showboat invitational and I bowled 250 under and I'm like, there's no way I'm good enough to be out here. You know, these guys are, these guys are a couple hundred over, you know, I'm not even close to the cash. So uh, for the kids at home that don't know what a payphone is, you had to put money in it to use the phone <laughs> and I'm standing in the showboat and uh, I called home and my dad picked up the phone and he's like, what's up? And I said, uh, two really horrendous weeks in a row. I said, I'm not cut out to be here. I, you know, I want you to send me a plane ticket so I can come home. And my dad's like, I, I'm not going to hear this from you. You can talk to your mom. And I'm like, oh, great. He's going to put mom on the phone. <laughs> so mom gets on the phone. She's like, what's up? And I'm like explaining to her 200 under, 250 under, no cash in two weeks. I want a plane ticket to come home. And she says, oh, OK, well, that's great that you've only given it two weeks. I mean, you're not even going to try. That's it. Two weeks. And if this is the way it's going to be, you can come home and your clothes are going to be on the lawn and you can move out and you can go get a job <laughs> or you can try the following week. And my mom, she makes no bones about it. She's like, you're a quitter if you're going to quit after two weeks. And I went, you know what, mom, I'll call you next week from uh, Northern California whenever we get done. So mom was pretty hard on me. I was a little disappointed, obviously. But if she doesn't do that, my, my life's totally different. I go on to Sacramento the next week and I just missed the show and finished sixth and make the show the following week in Dallas. So if it wasn't for mom, I would have been, who knows what I've been doing. You know, I, I would have had some mediocre job and I, I might've quit altogether. But I mean, if it wasn't for my mom's tough love, I wouldn't be where I am today. Well, and plus the, uh, the amazing trophy case right behind you as well. But uh, how often after that and over the years did, uh, did your parents remind you, uh, of that phone call and the fact that uh, that they didn't give in and, and send you a plane ticket and uh, and you were able to accomplish all that you did. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I tell you what, uh, I used to tell my mom, you know, you're why I'm I'm where I am today in my career. And then she's like, just the phone call. And I'm like, no, mom, you coached me when I was a junior. I said the tough love helps, especially when it's not going well. But uh, you know, they 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 always told me that they were my two two biggest fans, you know, and, and to this day, I'm probably going to be the only guy on the senior tour that has his dad driving around with him because <laughs> dad's like, I want to watch you bowl the senior tour. I'm like, come on, you know, I, 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 I would love to have him there. All right. Well, that's oh. a, a, a great transition. Of course, we'll talk about some of your successes over the years, but to speaking of the senior tour, of course, you left PBA tour competition around 2011. Uh, there were some injuries along the way. So some things you had to overcome, Went into the PBA Hall of Fame in 2012, USBC Hall of Fame in 2013. So 
really by any sporting standards, uh, that's kind of the way things would, would generally go. You stop and then you go into the Hall of Fame. But in, in bowling, of course, there's a chance now uh, at uh, future success and a whole new career on the PBA 50 tour. So talk about that. You came out in 2014 after the retirement and, and proved uh, that you're still a superstar. You won a, a big event, a super regional in Delaware. Uh, and then, of course, the big announcement came out that uh, you were going to be going full-time PBA 50 under the, the Ebonite logo uh, and really giving it 100%. So uh, talk about just some of the things you had to overcome and then walking away. But uh, did you know all along? that there was going to be a part two and, uh, and it's also pretty awesome that, uh, that you'll have a driver there and then you don't have to, you don't have to waste a quarter calling home this time, right? You'll be right there <laughs> to right. tell you, to tell you to man up in person. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always had an interest in the senior tour. Uh, but honestly, you know, I, I had, did have some injuries in 2011, you know, I, 2008, I had a, a, a minor knee surgery and then, uh, and I, I, gutted it out for a couple more years on tour, but you know, anybody will tell you as you get older, man, it just gets harder and harder out there. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be that guy that stayed out there too long and bowled too long. So my injuries were catching up. Um, so I decided to step back and, you know, take on a role at Ebonite being the, the sales manager. Um, but I still had bowling in my blood and, you know, I still bowled a little bit here and there. And then, uh, uh, I had a, second knee surgery. And this time I, I had it where they, they actually put two pieces of metal in my knee. So I had partial knee replacement and it feels amazing. Um, I, I feel better than I have in years and uh, I would like to have my other knee done, but with COVID coming along, that kind of put a damper on that. Um, but, you know, just the injury bug catches up with you, the older you get. And uh, so I, I've kept myself in good enough shape where I felt like if if I got to 50 and I felt like I still wanted to bowl, that it was going to be there. And, uh, you know, I, I still want to compete. And, and that's a that's a great way for me to do it. It's not near the stress of the regular tour is, you know, it's it's so hard to win out there. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. I'm bowling a lot of games right now. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, obviously, we know Emleto Monticelli. And Ron Moore and Brian Voss have really set the bar for preparation and fitness and, and being ready. Even Walter Ray showing his versatility, taking on the two-handed style to be able to do more things on the lane, uh, knowing that it was coming and now having the extra year to get ready. Have you done anything special, anything different uh, to to make this go around uh, as, as special as it could be? Nothing really major difference. Um, you know, I, I, started to understand that when I practice now, I can't do what I used to do, spend eight hours a day down at Kegel. You know, it was all about quantity back then and understanding lane conditions. It's more about quality now for me because I don't want to practice as long as I used to, but I still get out and I still do practice, but it's just, it's got to be a lot more quality shots in a shorter amount of time. So um, I do, a lot, you know, I'm, I do a lot of cardio. I do a lot of walking. Uh, you know, you need to have strong legs. I mean, that just because it's a senior tour, they, I mean, they bowl more games than the regular guys do on, on a regular week. So I better better have my butt in shape and I better be ready to go because, you know, it's it's hard on that tour. And, and you know, we got a few guys coming in with me, you know, you got Tom Hess, Brad Angelo, Chris Barnes is 50. Dave Wadka turns 50 next week. So it's not getting any easier to win out there. I can tell you that. Well, now, how many Jason Couch sandwich combos does it take to get through? eight hours of practice. Cause that seems like uh, quite a day on the lanes and you, you definitely need your energy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was always the, the practice regimen at Kegel was always get there by eight bowl for four hours, have a nice lunch at the deli, relax for a little bit and then get right, right back out there and do it again. Um, you know, I, I, and I've been down a few times since I started practicing again, but uh, not near as much as, as I probably should be. But like I said, it's, it's more about quality practice now. Well, certainly a huge benefit having Kegel pretty much right down the street for you. Uh, some great competitors in the area as well, right? Norm Duke, Randy Peterson, Walter Ray's not too far away, uh, yeah. and, uh, and and some other regional success stories, Doug Backer and such. Um, talk about that. I mean, some top, top com competition uh, in the area. Great competitors, John Janowitz, Vernon Peterson going the non-PBA route. So uh, definitely – a lot of folks to keep you on your toes there, but uh, who's really who's the best uh, the best bowler in Claremont, Florida? 
<laughs> well, there's a few guys that have opinions about that. Uh, Christian Ascona has just recently moved here about a year ago, so we have him here as well. And any given day during during a weekday, you walk into Claremont Lanes, and I'll be on one pair. Norm will be on a pair, and Christian will end up walking in. And you know, and so there's always there's always some some action if you want it. And uh, so uh, Claremont's like the the hot hotbed of, of bowling. It seems like these days for, you know, such a small town, one, one bowling center, 12 lanes, you know, that's it. And, uh, uh, for the last few months, I've had a few guys that, that are actually living with me because they're, they're from Europe and they can't, uh, you know, they can't get back and forth with the, with the COVID restrictions. I've had Dom Barrett living with me for about three months now. And, uh, Oscar Palermo is also, uh, living with me. So, man, you walk into our bowling center right now, there, <laughs> there's no guineas in, on any game in there. Well, hopefully they're they're keeping up to date on the rent there and uh, and taking good care of you. <laughs> yeah, that's uh that, that could make some you know, we we got to get down to Florida and just like get some cameras on these practice sessions. That 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 sounds exciting as it is, just having all those guys uh kind of kind of going around and of course uh with the World Series of Bowling going on right now in Tampa, uh also not too far away. Uh so I'm sure those guys are uh and I'm not sure how how they fared for match play, but uh, it's probably been a pretty exciting week just in general uh, with all the buzz and all the excitement that's kind of been in the area uh, with the PBA tour. Yeah, the, the you know the tour's been down in Florida for quite a while now, and uh, you know Tampa's Tampa's about an hour away, and uh, Dom Dom had a really good week. He made three of the five cuts, and uh, he goes back in a couple of days to bowl the Scorpion Championship. Um, he, you know, he's looking forward to that. And, uh, Oscar didn't have such a great, uh, world series, but, uh, we've been working on some things with him over the last few weeks, his game's starting to come around and with the, you know, with the masters coming up and the U S open, you know, those guys need to be kicking on all, all cylinders to, to, to perform well at those events. Well, it's a perfect transition, right? We've got two major championships coming up starting at the end of March, the USBC masters at the national bowling stadium in Reno, That'll be followed immediately by the U.S. Open. So it's the right time to want to peak and, and be as sharp as possible. Uh, and, of course, all of that action will be shown live on Bowl TV. Uh, but, Jason, you had some su success in the majors over the years as well. Of course, 16 titles, four majors along the way, three of them the Tournament of Champions. Uh, talk about those big events and just getting ready and getting amped up and, and just how you were able to kind of turn it up for when it was the right time. And, of course, uh, your success includes as well a runner-up finish at the Masters in that unique format. So uh, always able to step up on the big stage. Talk about that, and you know what advice can you give to those guys uh, as they head out there? Of course, they're already major champions, but uh, it can never hurt to to have the expertise of a Hall of Famer. Yeah, you know the majors were just a, a whole different animal. You know, when 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 I was out there bowling every week. You know, you got to approach it differently. It's going to be a lot longer format. You got to pace yourself with the format. You got to really focus on every single shot and, you know, don't throw away any pins. The scoring pace is usually lower, so it's more of a grind. And, uh, you know, when you, especially these, these guys coming up now, you know, I talk to them about their mental game quite a bit because you think about it, Masters and U.S. Open back to back weeks is just brutal mentally. You know, so you really have to pay attention and be focused on that. Um, you know, for me, it was about staying in the moment. You know, if it was qualifying, just, just you know, pay attention to scoring pace, but never look at the top of the leaderboard. Um, you know, you need to know what, what kind of scoring pace you need to, to be competitive and to, and to make the cut. But, uh, you know, I, I was never much of a board watcher other than that cut number and just, you know, making sure I have enough to, uh, to make the cut. Um, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's not saying, saying anything wrong about the regular formats, but you know, winning, winning the majors is a lot tougher to do. And it's uh, a lot more rewarding when, when you can snap one or two of those off. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that was a, that's a picture from one of the major wins right there, I believe from 2000 at the tournament of champions. Uh, you won the TOC three times in a row, a match that has, uh, or, or an, an achievement that has not been matched by anybody in PBA tour history. And, uh, you, you know, one of the cool things with, uh, and especially having the trophy case back there and, you know, Jason, you know, when I was a young lad watching you on, uh, 
uh, on TV bowling up, you know, you, you were the reason I wanted a matrix bowling ball, even though I was right-handed, uh, <laughs> but, you know, just seeing that go down, you know, all the power, all that. Uh, so I'm curious from all those wins, we see the trophies back there. Uh, I'm I'm curious more on the bowling ball side of it. Uh, are, are, did you save a few of those special bowling balls from those big moments? Are those hanging around somewhere, or uh, were you not as sentimental with the bowling balls? No, no, I still I still have them. Um, actually, you know, a lot of people don't know some of the things about those three tournaments that I won. It was three different bowling centers, three different formats. You know, and I felt very very fortunate to win one and. You know, it's just, I was at a point in my career where I was absolutely on fire. So, you know, any major that could come along, I was pumped. I was ready to go. Um, the first two TSCs that I won was with the black and silver original matrix. And I kept that ball. It's, sit, it's sitting tucked away so nothing can get to it. And then the third year, I actually won with a, uh, a V2 particle. And uh, that was the only game I threw with it all week was on the TV show. The TV show, they just felt like I needed the ball to start a little earlier. And, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Kurt Pilon, was back there. And he's like, try that other ball. And I'm like, ah, it's been early all week. And he's like, I know, but you you need to see the lane earlier, get it to read earlier. And uh, sure enough, you know, I come out with the front six or seven at Ryan Schaefer. And I didn't, th I don't even think I threw one strike in practice with it. I, I tripped the six pin, the last shot before TV, and then bangs, you know, six bagger. So. Um, yeah, I've got both those balls put away. I, I'm I like keeping stuff like that. I've still got I've got uh, I've got a black knight that Columbia made back in the 80s that I bowled probably seven or eight three hundreds and a bunch of eight hundreds with. It sits right next to those bowling balls. So I, I like keeping stuff like that. Well, we love tradition. We love sentimentality, uh, and we kind of love Kurt Pilon a little bit too. You mentioned him. <laughs> Uh, part of the Ebonai family for a long time as well, and, and uh, a big name at the Open Championships in recent years. So it's a perfect transition once again, almost like we set this up, uh, <laughs> but we did not. Uh, Kurt, a, a two-time winner in 2018 in Syracuse team event and all events, and then his team teammate Ryan Mal went on to win all events in 2019. Uh, but now we can talk a little bit about your Open Championships experience and career, which predates your PBA career by just a couple of years. Uh, you're just a youngster, 20 years old, joining us in Reno, Nevada, back in 1990. Uh, we always like to hear how that happened. Uh, who was it that recruited you to the Open Championships? Uh, how did it feel going to the event, getting to the host city? Did you do much traveling prior to that? Uh, and then, of course, uh, tell us your thoughts on walking into the venue for the very first time. Yeah, so 1990 was my first year, and a really good friend of mine, Mark Chimay, he had asked me to bowl on his team. Uh, we bowled league together here in Orlando, and uh, I hadn't done a lot of traveling with bowling at that point. Um, I, I went one year, I think it was 89. I think I won a, a, a state spot to the U.S. Open, uh, Edmond, Oklahoma. And, you know, I, so honestly, that was really that and a little bit, you know, bowled a couple of high rollers, but just not a lot of traveling at that point. And uh, I, I couldn't wait. I, I just – you know, hearing about the bowling stadium and how awesome it was, I was so jacked up to go there and uh, and see, you know, Reno. Reno's been a big draw for me anyways. Uh, you know, I bowled tons of events there. So um, it was awesome, man. I I was so excited. And uh, the first night I, I actually, I bowled, I think it was 606 clean in the team event. Just couldn't throw any strikes together. And uh, I told my buddy, Mark, I'm like, I'm so close, man. If I could just get a couple of hits, you know, I, I could I could really put a number on them. And he's like, Yeah, yeah, but you know, 600 in team, it's really good in the in the Open Championships. I'm like, I know. And he's like, I'm telling you, and you know, that's a good score. So the next day we go in there, and uh, man, things just fell in place, and I was severely lucky, <laughs> and I mean lucky. Um, you know, I paid the money to have the to have it filmed the six games that day. And I still have the VHS tape that, that I had from there. I got the front 10, all of them are aced and I get up and I throw it absolutely horrible through the face and it's just can openers for 11 back. So I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that that struck. And everybody stops in the building, you know, back then the open championships, the entire place stops. And I got up there, man, and I'm like, I can't throw it that bad again. I can't throw it that bad again. And I sure did. 
I threw it right through the face again and struck for 300. <laughs> so that's my first 300 in the Open Championships. And embarrassing, yes, but hey, 300's 300. So um, I pulled really good that day. I, I don't even remember what I had in singles, but uh, I bowled 780 in doubles. And uh, I know it was a high 700. So I ended up third third that year at the Open Championships. So definitely a phenomenal first time. First, Aaron Smith thinking, what's a VHS tape? First, that's the first thing in his <laughs> mind right now. But uh, talking about that night in Reno at 20 years old, um, nothing to do at that point but grab some dinner and get back to the hotel room while everybody else is potentially out enjoying all the amazing things Reno has to offer. But uh, you're absolutely right. Just whatever happened, whatever you had for breakfast the next day, whatever confidence you brought back in uh, to the same oil pattern the next day, uh, 793 in doubles and wow. 736 with the 300 in singles. So first, tell us about the double set. I mean, you mentioned things just fell into place for you, but to be on the verge of 800 uh, in your first Open Championships, obviously you, you understood the stage that you were on and the guys prepared you. I know Mark Shimei and and I'm sure – uh, the rest of the group that he had assembled, uh, very knowledgeable of the sport and the event. So they had to have you prepared for what to expect. And, and he had it right. 600 at the OC is a great score any year. Uh, but then to fire 793, to be on the verge of 800 in your first Open Championships, and then to switch pairs and follow that up with the scores that you did for singles. Uh, tell us about that because that's uh, that's big time for a, for a youngster at the OC. Yeah, I mean – a lot of nerves too, you know, I mean, being your, being the open championships and, and, and bowling with your peers and, you know, um, honestly, uh, you know, I, I mean, I told you I, that I threw it horrible for 300 and the, the third game on that 794, I, I left the seven pin in the first frame and struck all the way until the, the, uh, 10th frame. And I, I needed, I needed the first hit in the 10th for 800. And, uh, and I got up and I blow her 10 and not, I just shook my head. I'm like, I just threw two through the face for 300 and I'm not going to be upset about, you know, leaving a blower 10, especially after as fortunate as I was. And um, it was probably one of the worst open championships. My buddy Mark ever bowled. He had, he had earlier that morning, he had gotten a call from his, his own business that he ran, that he had lost one of his biggest customers, a multimillion dollar customer. And uh, he was just, he had nothing in the tank. I mean, he, I just felt horrible for him. And, uh, and, you know, that happens, life happens. So, um, you know, I never bring it up around him. I know that he would, uh, you know, he would have loved to have had an Eagle, but it is what it is. And, you know, you, you sometimes just hardships come down on you and, um, but it was awesome, man. And this, the seven thirty, I actually, I bowled. Okay. I, I threw it good. Um, I stayed with the same bowling ball all the whole tournament. Um, you guys, I don't know if you remember the black Cobra, the AMF made, uh, I threw that ball the entire Open Championships, all nine games. Well, a phenomenal start to the career. 21-34 was the all-events total. Uh, and again, uh, that year came after the scoring explosion of 1989 in Wichita. If, uh, if you remember, there was 44 300s, a record at the time, in 1989. And then your perfect game in 1990 was one of only four the entire year. Uh, the first one of the year bowled by Fred Borden. Longtime Team USA coach, so wow. uh, some good company there, but only four. So 44 to four, followed by 48 the very next year in 1991 in Toledo. So uh, you picked the right year to uh, to have a breakout performance because the, the scores the next year uh, weren't very good. We'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, to walk out of there 21-34 uh, and make a run at multiple Eagles, that had to feel pretty good. And at that point, uh, what were you thinking about the OC? Did you leave thinking, this is easy, I can't wait to do this every year? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I was on cloud nine on, on, you know, shoot 2100 after shooting six, six Oh five to start. I mean, you know, you don't ever, you don't ever dream of anything like that happening. And, uh, you know, I didn't really think about it too much until they sent me, you know, at the end of the tournament, cause we bowled fairly early on in that tournament. So I had months to wait to see, you know, where I was going to finish. And uh, the longer I sat and thought about it and then got the letter, you know, from, from the USBC that I had finished third in all events, man, uh, out of thousands of entries, you know, that was just, uh, just awesome feeling. Um, back then they gave the guys rings for the top three spots in all events. So I actually have a, 
USBC ring with an eagle on on the stone, which I I keep keep with a lot of my different 300 games and stuff rings, and it's just is it was an awesome feeling. Now you had two more chances at the OC uh, before the PBA tour began, uh, and in those two years, uh, six sets, only one above 600 after the great start to the career, but uh, then of course this transition to uh, PBA greatness. Talk about those next two years and, and you know the the reality check of it. Uh, getting into uh, two new cities, right? Two great cities in Toledo and Corpus, and then really uh, that was the start of your your global travels for the sport of bowling. But uh, maybe not the uh, the follow up performances you were hoping for on the big stage. Oh, without question, you know it, it's it's so hard to bowl good in that tournament. People don't realize it. You know, there's going to be some years you go that you're just not throwing the ball very well. And you know as well as I do that the conditions that you bowl on out there are much tougher than you'd ever experience in, in, in a normal league. And, you know, you and, and you get out there and you get behind early with a couple of splits or a couple of bad ball decisions. And, you know, now you're staring 1,600 in the face, you know. So it's uh, it's tough. I mean, it's a, t- it's a tough tournament to bowl in, especially to bowl well every year. Um, it's enjoyable though, because, you know, you, you get to bowl with your friends and, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of competition out there. Um, yeah, I, I definitely, uh, definitely didn't bowl well those two years, but, but I enjoyed it. You know, that's the, you got to enjoy it no matter how good or bad you bowl. You got to enjoy spending the time with, with your fellow competitors and, and your friends that, that, you know, you bowl with and, uh, um, you know, win, lose or draw, man, you know, you know, I, I just, I, I, you got to take the experience out of every event. So now with those, those first three years at the OC, the camaraderie, great teammates around you, uh, an awesome venue. Uh, is there anything special that stood out to you that that made you want to keep being a part of this event? Uh, had you had the opportunity, of course, we'll talk about what happened in the, in the decades that followed. But uh, what was it about the Open Championships really that that stood out to you uh, those first couple of years, and and would make you want to come back or recommend it to anybody else now? It's you know it's the enjoyment of your teammates and you know the. It's just, it's an awesome feeling. It's a different environment. Anybody that's never done it should experience it at least once. I, and I don't care what kind of league bowler you are. You could average 80. doesn't matter. It's an experience that you need to attend one of those events. You know, you got to love the fact that every time that you go to an event like that, if there's a USBC Hall of Famer on, on the same squad you are, they're going to get their, they're going to get their recognition. And it's, you know, and it's awesome. I, I love going before my squad and watching the squad for just so I can see some of those guys that I don't get to see all the time, you know, and it's, and it, and it's great experience, a lot of fun, you know, you just don't go out there expecting to win the tournament, you know, just go out there, you know, go out there to wanting to bowl good, but man, that tournament's so hard to win. Well, it's a, it's a good point that uh, it doesn't matter what your average is, right? We now have three average base divisions, bowlers of all ages and skill levels. So, uh, there's there's an opportunity to come out and, and enjoy the experience or take home some prize money, millions of dollars on the line and uh, a one in five ratio. So a good opportunity to, to at least get some of that money back and enjoy a great experience. And uh, as you mentioned, you never know if you can have that, that even one game in your career, that 300 uh, it gets you on the announcements for the rest of your life. So you did that in your first appearance at the OC every time you have come back or will come back from now until the end of time, you mentioned the Hall of Famers being recognized, but uh, even uh, even the regular guys who uh, who never had that achievement, but the, the 300 forever, you will hear your name. Uh, what does that feel like coming back and, and knowing uh, that uh, you're going to get that recognition? Even if you went on and didn't do anything else that you did, uh, you would always have that. How did that feel coming back in 1991? Yeah, I mean, it's just it, it was it was different. You know, I at that point, I hadn't started my pro career. And, you know, to, to, to be announced in front of everybody else, you know, you, you, you feel honored and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just an amazing, amazing luck for me for, for throwing two horrible shots and shooting 300, but it just feels great when, you know, when, when, when they introduce you to the, to each squad, every time you go out there, it's just, it's really cool. And then from there, of course, uh, as you embarked on your PBA career, that meant, no more open championships for you at the time based on the rules, but you did still get to enjoy the venue uh, as the USBC Masters took the same stage as the OC. 
uh, for uh, most of its many, many years since 1951. Uh, talk about that, coming back to the, the venue uh, in 1993, bowling the Masters only. So knowing or being familiar with the, the setup and, and what to expect in that regard, but seeing it in a whole different light, of course, being surrounded by uh, all the best bowlers in the world and, and a very unique format at the Masters. Yeah, so uh, that's if there was anything I could say that uh, negative about my, <laughs> my bowling career on the tour was I, I really wanted to win that tournament bad. You know, that one, the U.S. Open, you know, anytime it was a major and, and I had my opportunities uh, to win both events. Um, but it's just it's a different feeling when it's the Masters, you know, um, it's, you know, same venue as the Open Championships. And and uh, it was just a you know, I just I really bared down because I wanted to do good in the Masters every year I was there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's it's a different feel. You know, you're on different squads each day and you get to you know, watch the other guys compete on their squads. And uh, man, it's talk about a tournament that's hard to win. That one's really hard to win. Well, again, you had some great performances there. Runner up finish uh, in 2001 to, to some guy. I don't know if anybody even uh, would recognize his name uh, to this point, but uh, Parker Bone III uh, has gone on to do some pretty cool things as well. Some great company there. Um, but still, uh, there's still time to get on the waiting list if you want to try the Masters. It's coming up at the end of the month. We can. <laughs> Maybe pull some strings for you. Yeah, you know what? That that bum Parker, um, man, that's probably one of the most heartbreaking losses I ever had. And I still think about the shot. I had a five bagger going into the eighth frame against him. I was up in the match. He had a few strikes going, and I stone nined on a five bagger and ended up losing by less than ten to him. So I, I, I since then I've always called him Luckbox. That's my nickname for him is Luckbox. Cause he has to have some luck to, to, to beat me. Well, there's uh there's definitely a, a list of, of some guys who have similar experiences at the masters would really love to win that one. I know uh, that's one event. Maybe you don't want to mention around Pete Weber or Chris Barnes, uh, but uh, still many, many other accomplishments uh, in the career. And then uh, for you that, uh, that kind of transitioned again, as we mentioned, 2011 uh, and then uh, 2012, your final masters uh, under the, those rules. Uh, and then a couple of years away to to get the the knees and everything situated, uh, but you got to come back and join us in El Paso in 2015. Uh, again, seeing the venue and the event from a third perspective. Now you're now later in the career. Uh, you're surrounded by the Ebonite guys. If I remember, you mentioned Dave Watka earlier. Yep. Uh, tons of camaraderie, uh, and anybody who follows you guys on social media knows uh, that you certainly enjoy the time off the lanes as well. Get together annually i believe for uh for some sort of uh ebonite olympics that you guys do but uh so great friends uh, i guess that's the point i'm trying to make to get back to the event um competitively or not uh the chance to get on the lanes with those guys and enjoy this event again talk about uh, getting back to it in 2015 and and who you surrounded yourself with and what it was like uh being back at the oc yeah so i i'd taken quite a few years off from bowling the open championships and then uh Dave said he was putting together a few teams to go to the event. And I told him, well, if you have a spot, I'll, I'll, I'll go, you know, and, and I wasn't bowling near as much at that point in my life. And uh, he's like, oh, for sure, man, we want you to go. So we ended up taking 20 guys that year out there. And uh, we, you know, we all bowled next to each other and uh, had an absolute blast. Guys bowled good. Some guys bowled bad, you know, all over the place. But we had such a good time. That uh, and I met some new guys there that that I hadn't met through David, and uh, we're still friends to this day and, and talk quite a bit. And uh, uh, we actually have a group text called the Open Championships of all okay. those guys that, that we bowled with back then. Well, you certainly hit on one of the very important factors of the OC, right? And it's the people uh, that you you choose to go with or meet there, uh, along with getting to see some pretty amazing host cities, El Paso, of course, being one of them. Uh, just so many great things around. That was our first time visiting EP. Uh, so the chance to take advantage of a new location and great food and, and just uh, everything around. So uh, you picked the right time to come back and, and you bowled well. Shot 1,800, right? That's a, a nice goal to have at the Open Championships. Big single set there. Uh, but you had a great time and you met awesome people. So uh, that really, that, uh, that defines the Open Championships experience. So you took advantage of it uh, and you've been back a few years since and Hopefully we'll get to see you again in 2021 uh, as part of your your rehab and preparation for the senior tour. What's uh, what's happened in that regard? It's uh, 
also an opportunity as some redemption as 2019 maybe wasn't uh, wasn't the best performance of your career, but something to build on. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not going to get to go with the guys that I've been, been going with the last few years. It, it, it's a conflict with the uh, with the PBA 50 schedule. Um, but, you know, when I get out there in the summertime for uh, for the senior events on the West Coast, I'm kind of hoping to pop in and put my name on the sub board and see if I can't can't jump in there and get my games in for the year. Okay, there you well, go, Matt. That sounds like a, a prime social media opportunity to uh, get Jason Couch on a team. That's it. And, uh, you know, Jason, a, a big cr- crowd draw, so we can uh, certainly uh, see if we can't get some attention there. And, and I know, Jason, that's uh, also a good segue into a lot of the things you get to do off the lanes, right? Representing the sport as an ambassador. Uh, we know if we did some kind of sweepstakes uh, to bowl with Jason Couch at the Open Championships, uh, the the results would be phenomenal. But uh, tell us about some of the things you've done off the lanes as part of the Ebonite family, uh, you know, including uh, getting to bowl a little bit with LeBron James. So maybe some folks have heard of him uh, out there, but uh, some charity events, some different things uh, that I'm sure you're very proud of as well that aren't even scoreboard related. Yeah. You know, I try and uh, I'm trying to do what I can for the game um, as, as much as possible uh, to give back. Uh, I mean, you know me pretty well, Matt. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the easiest guys to come up and talk to, you know, I, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm very easy to talk to. I'm accessible. You know, I never turn anybody away if they want an autograph and uh, you know, I, I try and do things. I, I just played last Monday in a charity golf event to raise some money for cancer uh, for a good friend of mine. And uh, you know, just done many different things. And uh, you spoke a little bit about bowling with LeBron uh, that was in the Chris Paul charity event uh, a few years back and uh, had an absolute blast with those guys. Uh, you know, I, another guy that comes to mind right away is uh, Mookie Betts. You know, Mookie Betts is on my favorite baseball team, the Dodgers. Um, I'm sure you can see behind me, I've got a bowling pin up there. It says Dodgers world champs. And uh, I actually sent that to Mookie and said, Hey man, uh, you know, I really need you to sign this. And uh, it's really cool because he just he personalized it for me, put my name on it and said, loved watching you on Sundays. You know, so that's really cool that, that you know, he watched me bowl when he was growing up. And, um, you know, anything I can do, I, you know, to, to help raise awareness for the game and to give back a little bit. Uh, for years, I always did a, uh, a, a tournament down here called Lanes to Links, where there was it was it was four man bowling teams. And then we went and played golf the next day. And all the money we raised, I donated to Special Olympics of Florida, which is based here in Claremont. So that that was really cool to do too. So um, I try and try and get out and, and do as much as I can, and and you know to support the the game that we both love. Well, very cool. We appreciate uh, all the hard work on those fronts and uh, and helping all of those organizations and and folks. And you mentioned Mookie, of course, uh, a top notch competitor, and in, in his own right. But uh, I know. Off the lanes, you're also a pretty big sports fan, but I'm in my head trying to figure out the geography here. Now, I understand the Florida Gators thing, right? Because that's that's makes sense, totally logical, uh, and right. no better choice there. Uh, but the Washington football team and then the Los Angeles Dodgers. So uh, I know Aaron's got some sports related questions as well, but uh, walk us through that uh, and how how this geography works out for all these uh, these favorite teams. This is going to be really easy. So when I was uh, Growing up in St. Pete at our bowling center, we had a restaurant attached to the to the bowling center. My dad didn't want to manage the restaurant. He hired a lady to manage the restaurant. My dad's originally from Alabama, so he's an Alabama Crimson Tide fan, which is no good. Uh, and then um, and then he's a Dallas Cowboys fan. So the lady that he hired was actually from D.C., and she would take her two week vacation to Carlisle, PA, to watch Washington spring train. So get everything, you know, warmed up and ready to go. So every time she would come home from there, she would bring me a box full of clothes to make my dad mad. I'd have all Redskins gear on and, you know, running around the bowling center. And uh, just from then on, I've I've just been absolute nuts about them. You know, I got about, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 60 jerseys that sit in my closet. I I wear a different one every Sunday. You know, I got to have I got to have 10, 10, 15 thousand dollars worth of memorabilia from that team. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm so miserable on Sundays most of the time when they lose, but, uh, you know, occasionally they win a game and, and I'm happy for it. And then, uh, the Dodgers, you know, they, they spring, used to spring train in 
I went there. I went to Holman Stadium in Vero Beach, and I uh, I went to the last game they played there before they moved to Arizona. I, so I've been a lifelong Washington fan and lifelong Dodger fan. It's very cool. Uh, you you know we uh, we know a lot of people in the bowling industry, and we 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 get to see on social media who who folks are rooting for. And I know Chris Johnson here in the DFW area, a legendary Cowboys fan. But if there is one person who you enjoyed talking crap to about the Cowboys, if there's one that stands out more than anyone else, who is that for you? Well, this should be pretty easy. CJ is a good victim of mine when I give him the, the abuse about the, the Cowboys, but uh, Del Ballard Jr. is probably the guy that I give the most grief to. Robert Lawrence is on that list. Uh, the Monday before, the Monday of the week that they play two times a year, I, I have them all on a group text, and it's not very nice what I say to them. And I just tell them, your beatdown is coming this Sunday. And they, it just it drives them nuts. Now it's uh, we're getting ready for the draft and for free agency and uh, my team, the Bears, your team, uh, the football team uh, are kind of in the same boat here where we're both kind of kind of wondering about what's going on with our quarterbacks. So, uh, you, you know, I, I know the Bears are deep in the Russell Wilson talk right now and Twitter's going crazy and it's great and it's probably never going to happen because it's the Bears. But uh, I, I want to know, who are you hoping that uh, is, is game one starter? Uh, for Washington this upcoming season? You know, uh, with uh, Alex Smith being released last week, you know, that, that leaves a few guys that, uh, that, we have, that we have on the squad right now. And, I mean, I just don't see – I don't see anybody being a starter. I see two guys being maybe, you know, good backups, Josh Allen and uh, uh, Tyler Henneke. You know, he played great in the playoff game when he got in. You know, but that's one game. I mean, guys don't, you know, when you don't play a lot of football, they don't really know how you play the game. And, you know, it's like Cam Newton having an awesome first year or anybody that had a great first year, they figure you out at some point. The NFL players are just that good. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of hoping we go out and we get somebody. Um, you know, I just heard that uh, it looks like the Saints are in the market now because Breeze retired. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of teams that need a quarterback. So it could get very interesting this off season. Absolutely. And uh, one final tangent on this, uh, because his name has been linked a lot to the bears. Uh, but uh, you know, we're both picking a little bit later in the draft. Uh, Kyle Trask, Florida Gators. Uh, hey. some talk about a, a, you know, late first round, second round pick. So uh, how would you like to see that homecoming? I, I know we both got to experience Rex uh, to different degrees uh, back in the yeah. 2000s, but uh, uh, Kyle Trask, how would that uh, shape up for you? You know, he was, he was really impressive the last two seasons. His first season, he, he just seemed like he was just going through the motions. And then once he got the starting job, man, he just, he went nuts and, I could see him – I mean, he, if he does fall down into the second round, I could see both of our teams going after him. He's big enough. He's strong enough, you know, and it's he, he's a good decision maker. Um, so, I, I mean, I would love to have him on my team. And, you know, we need a lot more help than just a quarterback. I mean, we need to get some offensive weapons. And, uh, you know, if we could find a way to get another receiver like Terry McLaurin, I mean, it, we, could, we could certainly get good in a hurry. So – uh, I always look forward to the draft and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to this one and hopefully they make the right choice. You, you just never know with the draft. Absolutely. All right. Jason, as we were getting ready for this podcast, you, you said that uh, as long as it didn't interfere, of course, with the charity event that you had last week uh, and then uh, the Florida Gators playing basketball from March Madness, right? So a lot of talk about football. Do you have a go-to sport? Is there a time when, when you just don't mess with Jason Couch, don't bug him because, uh, the full attention is uh, is on that sport or is it just all sports in general? Honestly, it's anything university of Florida uh, or, or Washington or if the Dodgers are on. Um, but man, I mean, like I watched the sec tournament this weekend and you know, my wife knows she could be literally sitting next to me talking to me and that game's on. I don't hear, her. you know, I just, I'm so focused on them and uh, uh, they did not get great draw in the, in the, uh, the March madness yesterday. So their work is definitely cut out for them. So now, how does the events of the next couple of weeks? Uh, how does that interfere with the preparation for the PBA 50 tour? I mean, do you time the practice sessions around the games and the different things going on, or uh, do we take a complete break from the from the training regiment to to 
Focus. Uh, now I won't, if, if they're on, you know, if they're on this week, when they're on this week, I, I'll make sure I practice before uh, and, and just and, and have it out of the way because I'm not going to miss a game. So, you know me, I'm, I mean, I'm just, the teams I love, I love them. I'm a, I'm a fanatic. All right. Well, very cool. We're uh, we've learned a lot today about Jason Cash. We're at the one hour mark now. Uh, now Jason with the, again, the PBA 50 tour coming up, the open championships, everything looks like it's moving ahead. Uh, you got work. You're able to work from home and making the sales and doing things. Uh, just catch us up on on what the next few weeks are going to be like, uh, as far as you know. And and um, you know, is this going to be a, a full time, hundred percent, all the events commitment for you for the PBA Fifty Tour this year? I'm going to try and bowl most of them. I don't know if I'll make every event. You know, it, it'll depend on work. And uh, I get, I I do get supported by by Ace Mitchell. They 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 want me to bowl, which is a great thing. And that was a part of me leaving when I did from Ebonite uh, as a salesman is that they supported me bowling, bowling the PBA 50. I made sure that they were aware of it. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to continue to practice. I've got a few other events before the PBA 50, just some, some local stuff that I'm going to compete in and just be kind of tournament ready. I certainly don't want to bowl too much before we get started just so I don't kind of burn myself out. But, uh, you know, after sitting home for a year, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'll, I'll be ready when we get there. Uh, you mentioned the Masters being kind of the missing piece from the career, but uh, with all of you've accomplished, uh, is there one moment or one uh, success that stands out for you as a, as a top moment? Uh, probably my first title, because you don't ever know if you can win on the, the national tour until you do win. And, you know, it was a long time ago, 93 Windsor Locks, Connecticut. And uh, I bowled Hall of Famer Brian Voss for my first title and and, and beat him and you know, it just, you'll, you'll never forget when in your first time, because you, you feel like you belong on the tour once you get that first win. All right. Well, great, great stuff today. Aaron Smith, any final thoughts for Mr. Cash? Final questions uh, about, uh, about bowling, the Gators, about being left-handed, anything like that? Uh, I'm going to bring it around to left-handed, but it's going to tie into you, Matt. So, uh, you, you know, Matt, you mentioned earlier in the broadcast how uh, for the uh, top 50 players, uh, you got to write the story on Jason and, you know, both of you guys uh, bowling in the same area. I'm sure you got to see each other compete a little bit on the regional side while you were out there pretty regularly, Matt. So, Jason, for you, uh, are there any memorable Matt Canizaro stories that, uh, uh, you know, you can potentially recall? And if you want to say who before you met him or before you wrote the first <laughs> article, that's fine, too. But uh, uh, any em, any memorable Matt Canizaro on the lane moments uh, for you? I, honest, we didn't get to bowl much together as much as we should have, I guess we should, I should say, because he's a lot younger than me. So he was kind of, I was winding down and he, as he was coming out and uh, uh, I just, he was always, he was always that silent guy that you, you had to keep an eye on because you never knew when he was going to start striking because he was never really animated about it. He was kind of quiet, did his own thing and, uh, but a great bowler in his own right. Well, Aaron, what he's really saying is, Matt, thank you for uh, for all that the donation money in my pocket because uh, all that money that I earned writing stories about the Florida Gators at the newspaper, uh, I could have just given it right to him and saved myself the trip. But uh, we did have some some good times back then. Uh, I did travel uh, briefly with the the regional circuit there, but uh, focused mostly on this side of things uh, and writing stories about the great bowlers, uh, as you mentioned for that book. Uh, that was a lot of fun and. Uh, looking forward to the next anniversary and the next story uh, about Jason Couch. And uh, Jason, we appreciate uh, all the great insight today for joining us here on Inside the OC, turning back the clock a little bit. Uh, and really, still the payphone story, uh, one of one of my favorites. Um, things, of course, a little bit different now. So for for your youngsters, uh, when they're out there in the world doing things, uh, you know, the phone will obviously be uh, in the pocket. But uh, hopefully the advice will be just as good, right? Push them to succeed uh, and go out there and chase the dreams. and. Uh, that's, that's all I can do is uh, go out and get it. Uh, so thank you for being here today, Aaron Smith, you as well. Uh, folks, Bull TV rolls on later this week. We've got collegiate action from the ITRC in Arlington, Texas, the SWAC Championship Women's NCAA Bowling, and then next Monday back on the air for Inside the OC once again. Time winding down May 1st, right around the corner of the start of the 2021 OC. We'll have more updates uh, for some of the side events and things coming up later this week. So keep an eye on bowl.com and all of USBC social media channels for that news. And uh, with that, Jason, Aaron, thank you very much folks at home. 
That's the news for now. We'll see you on the Thanks, guys.